Ear six, almost an acceptable pearl five. Um, I never remembered to introduce myself, but this time I actually had slides for it. So um, for all three of you who aren't already aware, um, I am MST, I work at Shadowcat Systems. Um, our tagline is Pearl Consultancy with a Commit Bit and a Clue, um, which basically means um, helping customers out with development stuff, helping them with deployment, um, hence the war stories talk from yesterday. And um, generally, people, who, people who've, develop, who've been developing something for five or six years and go, hmm, we're making a decent amount of money now, but have a huge amount of technical debt. How do we unpaint ourselves from this corner? Well, we have some budget. Let's go and inflict it on Shadowcat. Um, which, honestly, I happen to find quite fun, but, you know, it's an acquired taste. Uh, <laughs> um, but, of course, this also means, because of a lot of the stuff we're working on is back-end web apps, we end up working on front-end stuff as well, uh, more and more, uh, which is fine. I, I much prefer wrangling JavaScript to wrangling CSS. The, on, the only approach I have to get working CSS is to write HTML3 with tables, put it in front of a web designer, and wait for them to beg me to write CSS for me. <laughs> Believe me, this is an improvement over me trying to write CSS. Um, but of course, front-end development means a metric shit ton of JavaScript. Yay. Um, so JavaScript, while it works, it does, classic JavaScript does have a small number of warts, the worst of which is probably scoping. Because of course, JavaScript is prototype-based scope, um, so the scoping ripples up from your current scope towards the uh, document route. And this is, tends to be really difficult for people to get their head around because it's very alien to like any other sort of scoping. The only time I've, really, I've otherwise seen it embedded in a language is in some um, fairly obscure Lisp dialect. Uh, now, some days I like to pretend that I understand how JavaScript scoping works, but I'm not always convinced I'm right. Uh, now, interestingly, there are actually things on CPAN that do prototype-style scoping, because, of course, there are. No matter what insane idea you're thinking of, there's probably at least two of it on CPAN, <laughs> and they're probably both a bad idea. <laughs> interestingly, one bit of prototype-based scoping that people do end up using quite a lot is DBX class schema, because the way it inherits defaults from the class into, an, into the object, and then you can clone a schema and then modify that, is semi-prototype style, written that way basically so that you could treat a schema just as a class, which was essential to, you, to making CDBI compat work. And while CDBI Compat is no longer something I really see anybody use, it was really useful because it let me steal the class DBI tests. <laughs> um, I regret one to in search far more than doing that, but it is a little bit weird. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so yeah, uh, okay, in JavaScript, var says localize this variable to the current scope, um, modulo the prototype shaming stuff. Uh, and so that, that's fair enough, but if you forget a var or typo it, everything is now global, which is why it's incredibly easy to accidentally modify global things and have shared state. Uh, CoffeeScript successfully makes this worse, which I'm quite impressed by. ES6, fortunately, somebody noticed this. First, you put use strict as a string at the top of your JavaScript file, and that turns on strict access mode. Now, sadly, it's a runtime use strict rather than our compile time, but at least it means if you type a variable name, you get an error rather than a bug. And the thing I love about this is it's a plain string because the string in void context is completely ignored by all JavaScript implementations that don't understand use strict and honoured by the ones that do. It's a horrible, horrible, horrible hack, and I would not be surprised if it was a Perl person who came up with it. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so, um, var is all very well, um, but it only gives you function level scoping. Even, so even with you strict, this is still a bit of a pain. Because, for example, if you do this, because it's function level scoping, it's the same x every time through the loop. So your callbacks actually end up all having closed over the last element of the array. <laughs> so what you do is, you do the scheme style let over lambda. Declare an anonymous function that takes x as an argument, and then call it with x as an argument. And that now means you have a separate x inside each invocation of that, which means your callbacks close over the right x. How beautiful. <laughs> um, and in fact, the last time I wrote a tiny list, let was actually a macro that rewrote to that. So long as it's a macro, it's not that bad. Actually typing it, not so much. But ES6 actually has let. So let x equals 3. And let scoping is exactly the same as mine's. Or at least it's sufficiently exactly the same that I've not found a difference yet, and I can't see a difference from reading the documentation. There's always the possibility that I've missed an edge case. Uh, sometime in the next six months, I fully expect him to figure out what it is. I can tell you right now if you want. Go on. Uh, there's the temporal dead zone. So if in the middle of a block you declare a let variable, and you try to access it in the same block, but before the declaration, there's actually an error, even if in an outer scope the same name exists. Oh. <laughs> so, for the, for the recording, and that was Mauka, also known as Lucas Mai, successfully pedanting me, as expected. <laughs> um, if you declare a let in an inner block, if you declare a variable with, it, with let in an inner block, you can't use it before... You can, if there's an outer variable of the same name, you can't use the same what you can't use the outer variable before it's in the block. Now, admittedly, I'm going to file that under. Ideally, if the developer does this, a small gnome climbs out of the back of the screen and hits him with a mallet. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, apparently there is a difference. Excellent. Um, but yeah. My new strict, or at least close enough. I mean, runtime new strict is better than nothing at all. I have attempted to write Python. Nothing at all was not funny. <laughs> uh, so that's a great start. Uh, and then OO. So um, <laughs> base JavaScript OO is, is, is fascinating. <laughs> I can think of other words for that, but I'm not sure we'd be able to upload the recording. <laughs> and falls down to the problem of most people still don't understand prototypes. So the way it ends up working is you have a constructor function which gets a new, a new scope in this, you poke various attributes into it and return it, or you can add it to the prototype for the function which will then get brought in. You can then call it as either foo or new foo which works subtly differently, so you will get very slightly different bugs out of your confusion about how JavaScript scoping works. Um, I speak from experience. Uh, ES6, on the other hand, actually has a class keyword. And it does extends. We recognize extends. We might have heard of this. Uh, you can give it a constructor function, define methods, and it actually, it, it's basically a veneer over the prototype-based scoping. But code written using this syntax generally behaves the way you actually expected it to, uh, which is nice. I can't afford that much alcohol, really. <laughs> um, special mention, there is a thing called Lodash, uh, which in the spirit of programmers making bad puns is designed as a sequel to underscore.js um, and has various things that you might expect, like map and reduce. Obviously, because it's not Perl, filter is called grep. Happily, the import syntax lets me rename it just to annoy everybody who, who writes JavaScript. <laughs> and the Python people, because, well, you've got it. <laughs> um, there is one slight annoyance of Lodash, which is it does map of things func, which obviously is the, other, is the wrong way around to us. There is another library called Ramda, R-A-M-D-A, that does have them the sensible way round. 
I have not played with that yet. It is on my list because I am very tired of never typing a Lodash call the right way round the first time. Um, but the advantage of Lodash's approach is it means that map things funk is equivalent to things dot map funk, which has a certain sort of elegance of consistency to it. So I'm not sure which, which argument order is actually better in general. I suspect I'm going to end up settling on Ramda because I'm bored of this, but um, it's worth experimenting with both, but probably not in the same code base. Uh, yeah, so um, short interlude. Um, single page applications. This was oh God. maybe eight years ago now. Dojo Toolkit was just stabilizing for 1.0. Lots of people were using YUI. Yahoo actually still made things people used. And the loading time was horrific because minifiers and tree shakers weren't nearly as good and browsers were terrible and people hadn't picked up as many of the insane optimization tricks as they have since. So we got, when we launched this application, the most constant user complaint was the loading time. And I had a couple of great JavaScript developers working with me on that project. The thing is, I needed them doing clever JavaScript. We could have like stopped for a fortnight um, and done full optimization, tried to get minify everything, pack everything down. The tools weren't there. We'd probably have invented a quarter of Webpack badly and all of our schedules would have slipped. And the, 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 the um, Shadowcat customer at the time was a startup with minimal runway. Honestly, I prefer the people with established code bases and money. Um, <laughs> so I'm like, OK, these guys need to be writing features. I am, compared to them, not competent to do feature development on this app. If I tried, they'd only end up having to rewrite it. So I thought, OK, maybe, maybe, just maybe, I can work around this and make the users happy without taking them or feature development. So um, has anybody seen the Sims loading messages? Where, where they put loading things, loading other things, and so on. I, I came up with basically the same idea. I, I hacked up some incredibly ugly, completely vanilla JS, so it could be in a script tag before the script tag that loaded the actual application. And all it did was fade it in and fade it out a series of text strings picked at random from an array. Uh, and I, 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 came, I came up with a bunch of them, all of them ridiculous. Um, loading, loading messages was possibly my favorite. Um, also, um, loading eye candy, which was always followed by loading mind candy. <laughs> Uh, it, the app was part mind mapping, so it was actually an even worse pun than you thought. <laughs> and the users were completely happy. In fact, from that point onwards, I don't remember a single post to the feedback forum complaining about the loading time. We got regular posts telling us how much they love the loading messages. <laughs> People are weird! But on the other hand, we had happy users and the people who were good at JavaScript got to keep carrying on writing features. <laughs> anyway, um, so ES6 is not everywhere yet. Um, hopefully, eventually, all browsers that don't support this will have died a death. But for the moment, we're, we're, we're supporting most of ES6. Um, and you're going to have to deal with fallback, which is fine, because there is Babel. Babel will take your ES6 code and basically parses it, mangles it, and spits out classic JavaScript code that runs the same way. Because given ES6 is pretty much all um, syntactic sugar rather than really new semantics, uh, the only thing it has to do that's a bit horrible is um, to make let work correctly if you have a variable in an inner block that's the same name as in an outer block. It has to generate up a different name for it and rename all instances. Uh, the generated code is surprisingly readable, though. So um, what you basically do is you set it is you set Babel to set watching your SSR, SRC there 
and outputting the compiled JavaScript to lib. Um, so you edit the SRC file, run the lib file, and that all basically just works. Um, so Babel is configured with a Babel RC. Um, my current Babel RC takes ES2015, which is the straight ES6, stage two, which is proposals that are likely to be accepted. And then I add on, I add on decorators and class properties because decorators are great fun and class properties let you actually have variables declared inside the block for default, which is very cool. One thing to be aware of, that plugins array is order sensitive. Um, you can't use a decorator on a class property if the, cla if the decorator plugin isn't before the class property. Otherwise, it just silently doesn't work. If you forget transform decorator's legacy, it emits a lovely error message telling you to add it, <laughs> which happened to me, and then I successfully added it second. And then it silently failed, and then I spent quite a while swearing. So <laughs> be warned. Um, but basically, Babel, much like FVWM2, is configuring it is kind of like training a brain-damaged hyena. <laughs> However, once you've trained it, it stays trained, so I don't care. Um, I, I did start off with a boilerplate, and then I got offended that I didn't understand the boilerplate, took it apart, broke my setup repeatedly, and ended up with that. But yeah, decorators. Um, as like every other language that hasn't already <coughs> stolen the at sign for something else like we have, um, you do at name of decorator, um, and that basically calls um, your function called whatever the decorator name is with the function body, and you can wrap it and return it. Um, class properties are, well, I don't think I need to explain that. And class properties with decorators. Um, the observable decorator is actually a real thing. It comes from a package called MobX. MobX is beautiful. You can annotate things as observable for properties and then computed for derivative results. And then basically, if you link into that from somewhere else, you will get a notification anytime something you used is stale. And that integrates really nicely with React. Uh, I've, been, I've been quite enjoying using um, React for the view layer and MobX for the model. Um, so, uh, this, yeah, okay, so have it, having a function called attribute, right, this is designed to be used as a decorator, target is the thing that the attribute is on, key is the name of it, descriptor is the JavaScript internal thing representing it, writable is just a boolean, worry about that later. Um, so what we can do is has own property, double checks that there's something specifically on that object at that level rather than inherited via the prototype chain, and then set that, set up some metadata space, pull that out of that, and then actress.specs.push. Oh yeah, this is a neat thing. If you just put writable when you're constructing a hash, if you put a variable name in, it assumes that you want a key of that name with the value of that variable in the current scope. If you think of the number of times in Perl you've written foo arrow dollar foo bar arrow arrow dollar bar. Um, in ES6, you can just write foo comma bar and it figures it out for you. Um, oh, and yeah, either I'm stupid or there's a bug in Babel um, because if I annotate a property that doesn't have a default, weird stuff happens. But um, I can force writable to true, so that doesn't matter. Oh, and um, the dot 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 is spread syntax. What that basically means is that's the moral equivalent of percent of descriptor, as in dereferencing a hash ref to then add a couple of extra keys. It's different to the way to the way the Perl syntax works, but it's a lot less typing than, any, than most other languages. Um, so then, you can have a function ro and a function rw, both of which you spread to basically slurp the entire at underscore equivalent at once, and then pass false and true for writable. Um, then you need a class decorator. Um, so again, 
Check to see if the meta's there. If there's no meta there, why bother? Just return it untouched. If there is, let's iterate over those attributes. Um, first, we need to call um, the super constructor. Um, yeah, I'm using a ridge because I'm used to that in around modifiers. This is basically the same thing. Um, and then, oh yeah, and you can also use the um, name and variable of the same name to unpack um, hash refs, which again is really nice. I would like variable destructuring like this in Perl 5. It would be cute. Um, and then check to see if we actually have that value in the arguments. Naming args is basically exists. So either use the argument or the default and then install it onto the object that we're constructing. Now, this will make sense in a minute. Um, so then you, you copy the prototype across and return the wrapped version. Now, this is where it gets fun because we tie it all together and we get something that starts to look a little bit familiar um, in that basically I'm duplicating has because I was bored of typing. So writing that gives me alamu or moose, a constructor that will take bar and baz as keys, um, read only and read write. Um, and oh yeah, the bug was without a default. So we should go back and go, um, if there isn't a default, then we, need to put, then we need to push the key onto a requires list, and then add code that goes, if the required attributes exist, check to see if there's any missing stuff. Oh yeah, and that is fantastic. Um, ES6 also has short syntax for lambdas. So that name, the, the fat arrow there is an argument list going to an expression. So you, you can see how that, that gets close to the, um, Brevity of Perl's grep, apart from the fact that has own property is kind of ugly. And then if you're missing any required attributes, we can throw an exception. Uh, so if you have something like this, and then log foo, it ends up being called O2 constructor. I think there's a way to fiddle it so the name comes out right, but that's going to require another several hours of swearing at JavaScript because the name property is read-only by default, and I think also marked non-configurable. So I, I'm going to have to poke into it with object.define property and see what happens. Um, but if we try and call the constructor without a required attribute, we get a bath. If we call the constructor with the actual attributes, um, we get something sensible out in the object. Um, Calling the method on it produces the sensible result. Um, if you create another one, notice we can modify the rewrite attribute directly, because this is JavaScript. And this is actually less typing than Moo, <laughs> which clearly means I should release a Moo extension that provides RO and RW subroutines. Um, so um, things I want to add to this. I want to try and do at lazy that takes a function that gives you the equivalent of lazy build. Um, and then that will, because again, JavaScript is all property based, you don't have a separate namespace for methods and values. What I'm going to do is install it as a property with a get function, because uh, you can basically do a tied property value. Oh yeah, JavaScript kind of has tie. It's just nobody notices unless, they, unless you read through the spec. Um, I'm fairly sure we can do method modifiers, and obviously I'm going to I'm going to attempt to do roles because you know subclassing is not everything, and also the prototype chaining system means you don't have multiple inheritance. And okay, multiple inheritance is kind of Satan, but no multiple inheritance and no roles is no fun at all. Um, so I said hopefully by YEPCEU when I said did this at YEPCNA. And then I submitted three talks to EPCEU and they accepted all three and I haven't looked at this code since. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, nah, rubbish. Um, so yeah, I, I, I've, I've hit the point where basically JavaScript does seem to bend pretty much as well as Perl 5 does. Um, the scoping is actually sane. Uh, the OO is... It's not quite where I want it to be out of the box. 
Um, but it's definitely fixable because the decorator system is powerful enough for me to completely screw with this thing. I'm also fairly sure I can get this to work in TypeScript with the slight problem that TypeScript decorators on the class end up screwing up the type signature for the constructor. And I'm going to have to find somebody who knows a lot more about TypeScript than I do to help me figure out how to fix that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of very Perl 5 in a lot of ways. So um, my conclusion, is it an acceptable Perl 5? Well, for the sake of the video, I don't know. <laughs> but it's definitely good fun. I, writing this stuff was actually entertaining. Um, so the current um, sketch version is set on that URL. Um, I'm going to have to rename it because there's already an NPM package called O2. I suspect I'm going to call it OOXYGEN. Um, the, the, the name O2 is basically me being a dick. Um, because one, oh, two O's is OO, and since I'm doing slightly less than Moo, I thought OO was an appropriate name. <laughs> plus, it's object orientation. Plus, you know, one needs oxygen to live. And also, the, of all of the um, previous attempts at implementing Moo or Moose-like things in JavaScript, Blue Feats was the, was the one I liked the best, and that one's called O.js. So this being, to my mind, a spiritual successor to it that works in ES6, O2 is there as well. I'm kind of, um, I'm not sure which I'm more pleased about at this point, the code or the fact that I managed to get four puns into a two-character name. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, thank you very much. <laughs> And apparently I waffled a lot less than the first time, so we have plenty of time for questions if anybody has any. What browsers are supporting or not supporting ES6? Uh, browser support at the moment. Um, according to my understanding, the latest Chrome and the latest Firefox both have most uh, baseline ES6. I'm not worrying about that very much because the um, decorators and the class property stuff isn't in baseline ES6 and therefore is probably not going to be widely supported until it gets standardized in either 7 or 8. And I have found that Babel generates actually quite readable source code. So given I, given I, can, given I can read and debug the generated code quite comfortably, um, in fact, what I, what I often do if I'm not entirely sure what's going on is kill the watch file so it stops overwriting um, and basically add warn statements to the generated code until I understand what's going on. So um, certainly Node has the vast majority of it. I suspect all of it and a little bit more. But I, I've, I've, I've not double checked because I am fairly sure that there are options to Babel if I go through the documentation where I can basically just tell it what my targets are and it will only rewrite the things that need to be rewritten. So I'm, 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 I'm kind of filing that under, I will shave that yak once I've got everything else working. Anybody else? No? Uh, yeah, I think all of your has own property calls are broken. <laughs> because anytime you call random object dot has own property, that's a bug. Because the point of has own property is you have an object and you're not sure what properties are actually in there, so you check to make sure. Uh, but it might have a property called has own property and that has a value of true or 42, and you try to call that as a method and your code breaks. So what you need to do is object.prototype.hasOwnProperty.call and then pass your object as the this argument. Okay, so. <laughs> Once again, <laughs> I am patented inaccurately. Um, has own property could theoretically be shadowed by another property. So in, in, in the same sense that somebody could have subclassed can, and therefore, if you want to be absolutely sure, you pull universal can out and would call it directly. Now, in Perl 5, that's an anti-pattern. But given I'm specifically wanting the baseline has own property behavior, um, 
what you should theoretically do is do is get object.prototype.hasOwn property, which is guaranteed to be the base one, and then call that on your object. Uh, I think a good metaphor for this would be um, don't call arrow meta on a catalyst controller because somebody might have defined a URL me action method called meta, um, which indeed Marcus Rumberg sat over there managed to um, break the moose, the moose version of catalyst with, um, at which point we changed all of catalyst core to use um, class mop class of, and then later moose find meta, which is the correct way to do it now. But, um, so yes, my has own property calls are technically wrong. On the other hand, to be entirely honest, if you've overwritten the has own property in a class somewhere that's your super class of what you're currently building, I am very tempted to say you avoided your warranty and you get to keep both halves. <laughs> um, of course, now I've said that, Lucas is probably going to take it as a challenge, and as soon as I release this onto um, NPM, he's going to find a reasonable piece of code that demonstrates that I still have that bug. But um, <laughs> we shall see. Um, anybody else? Excellent. In which case, thank you very much, and let's go get some coffee.